Welcome to Superstation, the future radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, October 28, 2018, and we are live tonight. We have a jam-packed show uh, planned for you tonight. Uh, you know, last week I told you, I think I told you last week, we would have Dr. Claude Anderson on uh, tonight. And uh, we have them on the line standing by, so we'll bring them on here in just a minute. Uh, midterm elections are coming up November 6, 2018. Uh, you know, we talked about, we've been talking about this some the past couple of weeks. And uh, we also dealt with some of the history of why black people switched from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party, the real history behind this, okay? So uh, tonight we're going to have uh, three guests. We're going to have Dr. Claude Anderson here in just a minute to deal with how black people can leverage our economics to enforce our political agenda, how black people can leverage our economics to enforce our political agenda, uh, number one. And then also we're, we'll talk about, uh, with him as well, we'll talk about uh, how we can fight gentrification, how we can fight gentrification as well, okay? So you don't want to miss that conversation. Uh, at the top of the second hour, we're going to be joined by Andre Batts. The Batman will be on the line with us. Andre Batts, founder of Motor City Black Age of Comics uh, Convention, which is taking place in Detroit Saturday, November 3rd at Wayne State University, Gullen Mall, Student Center Building, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., and I will be there as well. I'm on a panel discussion dealing with uh, Black Panther Decoded, the movie Black Panther, Black Panther Decoded. And then also in our second hour, we'll be joined by Dr. Walter Williams, the author of The Historical Origin of Christianity. He'll be back in Detroit at uh, Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, uh, Nandy's Knowledge Cafe uh, in Highland Park, dealing with uh, the historical origin of Christianity and the historical origin of Islam. He'll be speaking there Saturday, uh, Fridays, uh, November 2nd and Saturday, November 3rd, okay? So we'll have him on in the uh, second hour as well to discuss this, okay? We're broadcasting on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and also on our uh, YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, on YouTube. OK, and also you can listen uh, 9, 10, 8, 9, 10 a.m. Superstation dot com, 9, 10 a.m. Superstation dot com. Uh, and if you're in Detroit, uh, tune your dial to uh, 9, 9, 10 a.m. All right. OK, so I want to bring him on the line right now. We have the author of Black Label, White Wealth, the author of Poweronomics, the author of Dirty Little Secrets about black history uh, and his latest book, The um, Black History. Read, the Black History Reader, 101 Questions You Never Thought to a Ask. Uh, one of my teachers, Dr. Claude Anderson. Hotep, brother, how you doing tonight? Oh, oh I'm hanging here. Um, Michael, looks like I'm getting a sore throat. Sorry about that. Okay. So I hope I can make it through your, through your program. See, I got too much black in me. I can't take all this cold weather down here. Oh, yeah, I understand that, man. You got a, you got a, a sore throat. Okay. <laughs> Okay. All right. All right. Well, look, brother, uh, you know, I talked to you uh, last week and I talked about some of the things going on here in Detroit and uh, the takeover dealing with the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. We talked a little bit about gentrification, uh, gentrification going on in Detroit as well. And I wanted to have you on. Midterm elections are coming up. And a lot of people oftentimes misunderstand uh, what you are saying. And I wanted to deal specifically with two main things. Number one, how we can leverage our economics. Hey, do you have me on the radio or, or the computer? No, no, no. Uh -uh. Okay, I'm hearing the feedback. All right. Okay, I'm hearing the feedback. Okay, I, I want to deal with how do we leverage our economics to enforce our politics, our political agenda, number one. And number two, how do we fight against uh, gentrification in the black community? And they tie in, they, they tie in to each other, okay? All right, so uh, first of all, Doc, explain to us uh, what is politics? What is politics? A lot, of, a lot of our people don't understand this. Go ahead. Well, uh, and, and, and that's amazing to me, especially since most black folk in the country at least get a high school education, they want to go to college. And, but unfortunately, they don't understand the nature of politics or its origin. The, polit the political system as it presently exists, Michael, never never existed on the face of this earth until in the 1500s with the onslaught of commercialized slave enslavement of black folk in Europe and around the world. Politics never existed. Politics is a very simple premise that unfortunately we don't understand as a race. 
Politics is based on the simple premise of quid pro quo. Something for something. One hand of watch to the other. You you scratch my back, I scratch yours. If I vote for you, you owe me. That's the nature of politics. <clears throat> That's the first thing I've got to say with. And politics then decides who's going to get what benefits out of life and after the after an economic structure has been put in place. So let so this came so politics came into existence in the mid about fifteen about 1515 or 1509 to 1515. Okay. But, it came, but policies came in existence after the economics were put in place. Mm -hmm. and the economics, economics was black capitalism, and uh, which means we're based capitalism on the ownership of black folk. It's what means capitalism means owning, control the tools, the resources, lands, and using other people's labor to enhance you and to enrich yourself. So politics then is in place to protect the economic structure. Okay, politics is in place to enhance the uh, enhance and protect the economic structure. Okay, so okay, so one of the way the the the, the way I explain politics is, um, and I deal with it from a historical perspective, is uh, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. The legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Okay, and this is this is how I explain it from a historical perspective. Go ahead, brother. But see, but see, that's why politics came in after economics came into place. Mm -hmm. after, see, racism came into effect, as we know racism now, came into effect in about, about 1488, when mm -hmm. Pope Innocent put out a public edict that says that you're going to enslave somebody in, in the future. Don't slave, enslave people the way we've done in the past. Don't agree wages and be enslaved in the past, before, 18, before 1488. You had to be either prisoner of war, one, or two, for religious persecution, or three, because of personal indebtedness. That was the only three reasons. The contrary is what you hear on the Fox Channel. Never in the history of the world were anybody enslaving anybody until Pope Innocent put out his public edict in 1488. He was a Catholic pope that says, now based on the skin color, because they had, mm -hmm. had 16 blacks by Henry the Good Navigator, put them into the Catholic Church back in 1445. Right. So that that started that started racism. Now racism went into effect to be used by the by the, by the Europeans in about 1503. At that time, they said let's use let's, let's switch from mercantilism to capitalism. Capitalism, based on a very simple premise, means he who owns the land, the tools, the resources, and uses other people's labor to enrich themselves. And once they decide to do that, they said all we got to do now is use the land in the in the West, the Americas, and use blacks as slaves. That's when that system started off, that began to, and they put it under a doctrine of unequal exchange so that blacks would get nothing out of it, and they could use blacks to enrich themselves. And from when, once they put that system in place, about six or seven years later, they said, now that we're going to be building up the wealth in the hands of European whites, that's what the racism is about, is a race. Now they've got to put something in to protect this wealth. So, they, 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 so that's when politics starts. Politics is designed to protect the wealthy class of those who own the businesses. That's why to go down to Katrina, and you have a, mm -hmm. you have a hurricane in in in, 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 in uh, Louisiana, for example. You have black folks sleeping on on bridges and on the roads with no food, no water, no no medicine, no clothing, nothing for two weeks. And and, and they try to send somebody in. They send the military. When the military comes in after following a hurricane or a race riot, they're coming in there to protect the businesses and protect white folks' lives. They're not coming in there to do anything for black folks. Politics protects the system that's in place, the economic structure. Right. Okay. So, um, and you and I have had these conversations. You and I talked uh, last week as well, and week before that also. And we were together with uh, Dr. Boyce Watkins in Philadelphia, end of uh, last month, uh, September 29th, I think that was, in Philadelphia at the All Black National Convention. Okay. So, understanding all of that, right? And um, how do we um, leverage our economics to enforce our politics? Very simple, mm -hmm. and I and I put this in almost every one of my books, especially for the black black labor. Yeah, black labor. White and I've got them right here. I'm showing them to the camera. Yep, okay. go ahead. And, and, see, and what black people have to understand, what, and they never never force and demand that white folks address mm -hmm. the whole purpose of slavery, Michael. Yeah. The purpose of slavery had nothing in the world to do with social integration at point of civil rights. Right. It was a, it was a systematic way of male distributing. Almost 100% of all this nation's land, minerals, businesses, wealth, power, rights, 
privileges and controls of all levels of government into the hands of the dominant white society. That was the purpose of slavery. It right. had never been, been, been corrected because black folk had never demanded to be corrected. They went into <laughs> social integration and civil rights saying, well, we'll accept our status of owning, controlling nothing just as long as we can get along with the white society. That's why to presently black folk own and control in our society one half of one percent of the wealth and the power of this nation. Mm-hmm. And the greatest power in this nation is wealth power. That's why black folk are non-competitive in this nation and in Detroit. They would never, never be able to compete because they don't own and control any wealth and power unless they learn how to use it effectively in the system I got called the five-story building, which is... Are we on Facebook about. Live? That's not working. Okay. okay, go ahead, brother. Go ahead, Doc. Okay, and then, until we use the five-story building now. So if you want to start talking about how black folk can leverage their wealth, the first thing they must do is to get hold of some land and, and assert, uh, establish a territory where they can practice group where they can practice group economics and group politics. They must have a, either a community or a sense of community. And once they establish that territory and they mark that territory, they mark it, that's what the first thing an immigrant would do, come in there have they have little Italy, they'll have Polish town, Greek town, hockey town. Uh, court town, Mexican town, Japan town, Chinatown, they establish and drive a stake in the ground that this is our turf. Black people have never, since, since slavery, ever tried to establish turf. Now, once you establish that turf, then you, then you start practicing group economics. Mm-hmm. It means you do everything you can to acquire and attract and hold money and wealth in your, on your land and your community. Right. And then, then that's, a, that's the first floor of building wealth. And the, and the second floor is politics. You cannot be effective in politics until you have a territory and you got an economy underneath you. Your economy dictates what you're going to do in politics. And, what, and, you go, and so what you do is get your wealth, make your wealth revolve eight to 12 times in your hands. Never let a nickel or a dollar or a penny out of Detroit, Michigan, go across eight mile road until there's bounce in a black person's hand, different black people's hands, eight to 12 times. And when you start revolving that money around, it, it multiplies eight to 10 times. Detroit, uh, 16 years ago, had about $11 billion of, of disposable income inside the city of Detroit mm-hmm. between the river and Eight Mile Road. All they had to do, Michael, to get a political script was to revolve their money around, multiply it, make it go through every black person's hand so it would no longer be $11 million. If you multiply it 10 times, it would be over $100 billion that black folk would have had in disposable income in Detroit. When you take that income, that, 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 that like, whether, it's, whether it's $1 billion, or ten, uh, hundred mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. You take that money then, and you move to the second level. The yeah, second yeah, level yeah. is politics. Yes. And what you do is you take yes. that money and buy yeah. every politician you can buy on the second floor. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about vote. Vote ain't worth a darn. Vote will get you nothing in a democratic society where you are a planned minority. Then you buy every politician. If you can't buy every politician on the second floor, you rent or you lease them. Right. So let me ask you a quick question. We're coming up on a break in three minutes here. So what you're saying is is that when we play the game of politics to win, and you and I have talked about this before, you're talking about leveraging your economics. So once once you leverage your economics, and, and, and let me give you a quick example. We're coming up on a break. Let me give you a quick example. You, you, uh, back February 19th when I interviewed you, uh, when I interv- interviewed you, we were talking about, uh, I, I gave the example of how in St. Louis uh, two years ago, St. Louis is 67% black. And the mayoral election was taking place. So you had a black woman running to Shara Jones and she was she was in the lead. She she uh as far as black candidates. You had three black black men who were running and uh what happened was they split the black vote and a a sixty four year old white woman who was the city council uh on the city council, she became mayor of this city that's sixty seven percent black. Because they split the black split split the black vote. So when I asked you about this, I was saying now in the situation where they're the majority of the population, you're not saying that they should not vote to keep this woman out or to vote people out of office who are doing harm to them. You're saying that we have to do a lot more than that. Is that correct? That, that, that is absolutely correct. You got to start demanding accountability. You gotta yes. Know exactly. When you vote, you got to get a you got to get a contractual a, a commitment between putting people in office and a direct uh, tangible benefits recurring to you. Right. If you're not going to get any benefits, don't play the game. Right. So 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 just just so people understand, because I I travel across the country and and people and people mi- uh, misunderstand what you're saying. You, what you're saying is we have to get something tangible for our vote, 
as opposed to just as opposed to maybe just voting out of obligation or voting and not knowing the background of the person, not knowing their politics, not knowing their policies. Is that correct? <laughs> Doc, Doc, I ask people, no, Doc, you don't understand. I was just speaking at uh, Hartford Memorial Baptist Church uh, last weekend for their social justice ministry. And whenever I do my presentations, just like when we deal with gentrification, right? And I was speaking, uh, I was speaking, uh, uh, Joanne, uh, I was speaking at uh, Sacred Heart uh, uh, Activity Center for the State of the City analysis. And I asked people, what is it? about the last 500 years of history you don't understand. When we deal with gentrification, everywhere Europeans went out throughout the world, everywhere Europeans went throughout the world, they did the same thing. What is it you don't understand? Okay, we're coming up on a break, uh, Doc. So when we come back, we're going to jump right, right into this. And I'm going to play this clip from Dr. King in 1968, shortly before he was assassinated, when we come back from the break. And Dr. King is dealing with how black people were locked out of the redistribution of land after slavery ended. Stand by, Doc. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotep. We'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, guys, stand by. Uh, it's the mic on my micro. Uh, it's the mic on my computer, not this mic here. I need a new laptop. Uh, I don't know. You can watch us at uh, the African History Network on Facebook. That is uh, working well. Uh, the African History Network on Facebook, that, that broadcast is working. And then also, um, hey, if you want to donate to the African History Network, you like this type of information, paypal.me, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Also listen at um, uh, 910 AM superstation.com, 910 AM superstation.com, okay? All right, uh, we're on uh, we're on a two minute break, mandatory two minute break. We'll be back in a couple minutes here. Okay, let me ask you a question, Azrae. That you using this camera? What would that that this one? that display up there? Where is that broadcast? On the app. On the app. Um, yes. Okay, so it's not archived. It just replays and then it, it, it's like where's okay. Uh, it might be on the the website. They change it so much. I don't know, but I can look and see. Okay. Because I wanna I wanna get the video and the audio. What what's wrong with the Facebook Live? Stand by, guys. We'll be back in a minute here. It's just the system we use to connect the audio broadcast. It's not working. Like uh, it's just it's not working. All right. Thirty seconds. Okay, I'm gonna play that Dr. King clip. Coming back in? Or just... Well, no, no, I'm gonna introduce it. But when we come back, I'm going to introduce it. And then I'll go back to Dr. Claude Anderson. <coughs> okay, on Facebook, we've got Angie. Let's see, we've got Angie, David Johnson. Everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page, okay? Share this broadcast on Facebook. Okay, let's go. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, October 28, 2018, and we, were, we are speaking with uh, one of my teachers, Dr. Claude Anderson. Uh, visit his website, Powernomics.com, Powernomics.com. Here is his latest book, A Black History Read. 101 questions you never thought to ask a black history reader 101 questions you never thought to ask uh, visit his website uh, powernomics.com I know he has a bundle pack there he'll talk about also visit africanhistorynetwork.com we have all of my DVD lectures there podcasts of our shows uh, email us at info info at africanhistorynetwork.com uh, to uh, advertise with the African History Network as well. And we have for our children to teach them our history, we have the Mel Trek series dealing with exploring ancient Africa, also exploring pre-Columbian America. Uh, these are uh, cartoons for our children. We have the storybooks and we have the coloring books also. In our second hour, we're going to be joined by Andre Batts of the uh, Motor City uh, Black Age of Comics Convention, talking about the Black Comic Book Convention coming up in Detroit November 3rd, Saturday, November 3rd at Wayne State University. We know the film Black Panther was a huge success, 
and we understand that African the, the African American owned comic book companies are really becoming popular now. They're really becoming popular because of the film uh, Black Panther. Uh, also in the second hour, we'll be joined by Dr. Walter Williams, author of the book The Historical Origin of Christianity and the Historical Origin of Islam. He'll be speaking at Nandy's Knowledge Cafe coming up Friday, November 2nd, Saturday, November 3rd, uh, here in Detroit also. Okay, uh, so uh, Dr. Claude Anderson, you there? Okay, all right. Hey, I want to play this clip here. Uh, this is about a minute and 15 seconds, something like that. This is Dr. King um, during the Poor People's Campaign. This is 1968, shortly before he was assassinated. And he's talking about the massive land redistribution after slavery ended and, and, and how black people were locked out of this land redistribution. Let's go to this clip, Azure. At the same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, today many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And this is what we are faced with, and this is a reality. Now, when we come to Washington, in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. Okay, stop it right there. What's it? Put me back, it on. Put me back on. Okay, all right, Doc, did you hear that? I did. Okay, so this is this is Dr. King tying into what you were saying, number one, on your five-story building, talking about getting land. And he's talking about how we worked the land for 246 years for free. Then they had the Homestead Act of 1862, the Southern Homestead Act of 1866, and we got locked out of this land uh, redistribution. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I, I, I commend him to that fact. Way before when the Civil Rights Movement first started, way before 1968, when he made his speech back in 1960, and in, in the Detroit Mall down, down Whitman Avenue in 1963. So I was trying to tell black folks then, mm -hmm. as a resident of Detroit, you're going the wrong way. Civil rights is not your issue. Right. Poverty is not your issue. Poverty is a horizontal issue. C having a campaign on poverty is an absolute waste of time, expending black folks' money, time, and resources. You cannot eradicate poverty. Poverty is a fix, just like just like a, a, a up is a fix, down is a fix, in is out is a fix. Uh, you will always have poor people on earth. The Bible told you that. You, as long as you got rich people, you have poor people. And unfortunately, this, that whole movement and, and, and Martin, the movement got locked into trying to eradicate poverty, which is impossible to achieve. You cannot eradicate poverty. What he should be trying to do is try to, which, which he finally done on the MF out in politics too, is that you is rather trying to eradicate poverty, just try to leave poverty alone and get blacks the hell out of poverty and try to enrich them. And he said it finally dawned on him in, 19, in 1968 before he became assassinated. That's the first thing. Secondly, we talked about the land. He was right there, partially right. The problem was he did not go back far enough. Mm -hmm. He went back to the he went back to uh, to the. Uh, to the 1860s, right? The Civil War, like the Homestead Act of 1862. Yes. He didn't go back far enough. Yes. He had a full understanding of the issue. He should have gone all the way back to, to 1790. Mm -hmm. 1790, the first immigration laws and the United States Constitution established what would happen when 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 when, when they ratified the Constitution. And they said the immigration laws are bringing all these Europeans into America to to get what they call the American Dream. That's what Martin Luther is focusing on. And the American dream is based on two things. For whites coming in, or anybody who can pass for a white, even, even if they're Asian, Arab, anybody else, or Hispanic, they can pass for whites. They're entitled to free, unearned benefits called the American dream. Right. The American dream means coming in and get free land and free black labor. And, it wasn't, and Martin said it was millions. It was not millions. It was billions. Mm -hmm. when, they, when the movement started off the free land, George Washington said, I want this, the wealth of this nation is going to be invested in the land. I want 100,000 acres of free land, say right. George Washington. Right. I was definitely saying that they're going to give Washington 
100,000 acres of free land. I want 100,000 acres of free land. Patrick Henry that you read about in school books said, well, give me lift, liberty or give me death. He said that if you give those two guys 100,000 acres of free land, give me 65,000 acres of free land. And consequently, <coughs> the nation gave out two billion, B-I-L-L-I-O-N, two billion acres of free land. Mm-hmm. And to the hey, Doc, you're breaking up. Go ahead, repeat that. They gave out two billion acres. Go ahead. Every white person coming to America, an uh, Asian, Arab, Hispanic, anybody else could get, could get two, they can get 650 acres of free land when they set foot in this country. Mm-hmm. The Home Setting Act. And then, and, but every slave they owned, they got another 150 acres. Mm-hmm. So they, set up, they set up the railroad system. They, gave, they, gave, they had 12 railroad lines. They gave each one of 24 million acres of free land. In the railroad lines and all the investors got six miles of free land on both sides of the railroad, all the way across America, every way to where you went. And all that came, came, up, to, came up to $24 million dollars dollars and, 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 and that acre of land went to the railroads. Everybody got rail, got money, but the wealth is in the land. Right. Why? Because you see, as I said, everything of value is within the land, and it's been passed on from one generation to the next. That's why white folks right now only control 99 and one half percent of all the wealth in America, in the land, the gold, the silver, the chrome, the pulsite, the gas, the magnesium, and the oil, and the timber on the land. And it's been passed on for every white subsequent generation since, since the founding of the country. And right. every, every 20 years, it doubles and triples in value. That's why black folk only have one half of 1% of this nation's wealth. They cannot compete. Tell them to quit wasting their time talking about voting. You, the second thing you must understand is what a democracy is. Mm-hmm. A democracy was found on the majority will win and the minority will lose. Black people are the only permanent, permanent, involuntary minority in this country. That's why black folk now. Only, only, only represent about 13% of the population. Yeah, 14%. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, 14%, but go ahead. Uh, they're, they're outnumbered 10 to 1. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and because they're outnumbered because of the, because of the immigration policy in this country that was set up to keep blacks so as a minority. Before, before the civil rights movement, before the civil war ended, that black folk in this country made up almost 50% of, of the population in six southern cities. You were the majority right. of the population, but they root, reduced you down from 50 percent all the way back down to 9 percent, then you work your way back up to 13 percent, 12 percent. You cannot, so you can't, your vote is not material. Your voting, the whites don't need your voting. They don't so, need your vote. I told you what the process of voting was. What you got to do is have economic power. If you get right. economic power, you don't have to vote. That's why the mafia, organized crime, is not, criminal members are not going to vote. That's why rich people in this country don't have to vote. They got the power and the wealth to do what they want to do. They okay. Do they use voting as an intellectual or emotional masturbation process that relieves black folk and give them some kind of comfort thing they're achieving something by voting. You, just, you can't get anything out of voting unless you get some commitments from the people who right. are running for the office on what they're going to deliver to you to increase your quality of wealth and power and resources in this country. Right. So I want to go to uh, level three. We talked about number one, get land. Number two, get politics. And once again, for those just tuning in, we're speaking with Dr. Claude Anderson. And as you stated before the break, when you talk about voting, what you're saying is, is that black people just voting is not going to solve the problem. You have to get something tangible in exchange for your vote. This is what you're talking about. You have to leverage your economics to enforce your vote. This, this is what you're talking about. Okay. That's why um, mm-hmm. this country right now, you, can, you got about oh, almost 600 white multi-billionaires. Mm-hmm. Those white multi-billionaires control whatever goes on in this country. Your vote doesn't mean anything. That's why never in the history of this nation has any p- political candidate and, uh, or, or political party ever did anything specifically and solely than directly to benefit black people in this country. Because black folks don't have enough wealth and power to back up their vote. Right. So let me ask you a question. Right now, we see rampant voter suppression going on in Georgia. We see Brian Kemp with the exact match program. We see something like 1.4 million people purged from the voter rolls in Georgia, uh, in uh, 
in 2017. We see he's blocking 53,000 people from registering to vote right now, 70% are black. Uh, we see uh, gerrymander, gerrymandering cases going before the U.S. Supreme Court. We see North Carolina. We see uh, a voter suppression case uh, coming out of Ohio, which was uh, upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. So uh, let me just ask you this question. If the black vote does not matter at all, why do Republicans work so hard to suppress the black vote? Or, or, does it, or does it matter more than we think it does, but we have to back it with our economics? Go ahead. It, it, it's a it's second point, because otherwise it's fake news. Whites don't need your vote. Whites right now, they didn't need your vote during slavery or during Jim Crow slavery if they want. Why, why would, if, if I, if, let me make it simple for you. If okay. If I had a fence with, 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 with uh, ten, I mean, nine or ten hungry bulldogs in a fence, they were voting what they're going to have for lunch, mm -hmm. and I threw a rabbit in there. Who cared about what the rabbit thought? If he's out number ten to one, but people are hungry, going to try to maintain the power inside that fence with those bulldogs. Or if I put nine, ten, uh, uh, two plus clan them into a room and throw a black in there, they're going to kill somebody, a murder somebody. Who cared about the black vote when you're outnumbered? What you got to do is to say, I don't care who runs for an office, whether you're black, white, pink, yellow, or polka dots. Whoever runs for the to make a commitment to what they're going to do specifically and solely for black folk to get my vote. If otherwise, if you're not going to deliver anything to black folk, just like I, you can call this play this game about exercise of life, that's immaterial. Right. Because if I can go, if right now you told me I could go to a gambling casino in Detroit and exercise my right to go into a gambling casino in Detroit, but if I knew that up ahead uh, that, that, I, that the dice would be loaded, the cards would be marked, and the machines are rigged, and I'm not going to win, why would I want to go into the casino and, and, play, and get, go, enjoy the exercise? You don't. Right. Vote. Voting has nothing in the world to do with getting an exercise. If you want to exercise, go to the gym and take out a membership or run a jog around the park or around the block 20 or 30 times. You don't, you go to get, you go to get benefits. Policy right, no, I understand. No, to, I totally agree. Policy is about getting benefits. I totally agree. Voting is a tool. It's not the end-all, be-all, and, and you have to get benefits. So, and like I said, go back, it goes back to the premise at the beginning of the conversation. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. The legal right. distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. We don't understand it from uh, that perspective. Okay, uh, and just very quickly, uh, Doc, in, in the 2016 presidential election, do you know how many black people registered to vote? Just curious. No, I don't. See, I don't, I don't waste my time. Okay. You, you, you All right. Earlier about the suppression. Let, let, let me make this point very quickly. Go ahead. Get, move on. Yeah. About voter suppression. Mm -hmm. These black folks know if they were to read, have read my books, any of my books, mm -hmm. especially the last one, the black history readers, right. all they had to do was go to the, you know, go to the Constitution, mm -hmm. to the second Constitution. you got two Constitutions. Mm -hmm. The second Constitution is the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Look at the 14th Amendment and look at the, and look at the first addendum, uh, article beneath the, 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 in, that, in that amendment. Article 2, it says that if black folks are to read those books, they understand. Mm -hmm. If white folks suppress your vote, you don't have to, you don't have to worry about winning. All you got to do is demand that they lose. That, that says that if black people are denied the right to vote through suppression, then the, then the, then the process will neutralize and they must extract out. I didn't hear anybody who elected at the state level or federal level. If every vote that's lost, they want to lose the damn election. Tell them to go read the Constitution and uh, right. the 14th Amendment. Look at that article two there in that uh, in that section. Section like, section two of the 14th Amendment. Section two of the 14th Amendment. Don't worry about voting. Okay. Don't waste time talking about suppression. Just go and just say we're declaring this election null and void because you suppress the black folk. Black folks sometimes amaze me on the silliness in playing politics. Okay, so people can read the U.S. Constitution. Two places you can go and read it for free. Number one is loc.gov, which is the Library of Congress website, loc.gov. And then uh, the second place you can read the U.S. Constitution uh, for free is archives.gov. Uh, that's the National Archives, archives.gov. So you're referring to the, uh, um, the 14th Amendment of 1868. So this is right after, uh, the, well, three years after slavery ends. And uh, just uh, since you mentioned it, uh, I'm just going to read quickly here what it says. Because I carry a copy of the Constitution around with me. So most people listen to my show know this, right? So Section 2, huh? Something else, something else, Michael. Yeah, okay, so Section 2 of the 14th Amendment says, Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed, but when the, uh, but when the, uh, 
but when the right to vote at any election for the choice of electors for president and vice president of the United States, representatives in Congress, the executive and judicial officers of a state, or the members of the legislature thereof is denied to any of the male inhabitants of such state being 21 years of age and citizens of the United States or in any way abridged except for participation in rebellion or other crime, the basis of representation therein shall be reduced in the proportion which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens, 21 years of age in such state. Just explain that briefly, brother. What does that mean? Exactly. It, it wasn't about lesbians. It wasn't about transgender. It wasn't about midgets, humpbacks. It wasn't about nothing. This, this was only for black people. That's right. What had nothing to do with Hispanics and Arabs and Asians and anybody that was about black folk. But black folk don't understand this. That's why they keep, that's why <laughs> nothing has happened to black folk by accident. They're right. never going to get out of the ditch until they start understanding these issues, Michael. Right. They don't understand them. They sit there and lift up with white folks and you go out and vote. Vote for what? They gave, they gave Obama, Obama 98% of their votes almost twice. Mm -hmm. They didn't do one darn thing for black folk. And I found out from a study from, 18, from 1960 to 1990, mm -hmm. on, 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 with the blacks in the 1960s, you had about 103 elected black officials in the entire United States. I looked at the social discomfort indicators, Michael, mm -hmm. and what black people, what's happening to blacks in food sales, welfare, imprisonment, dysfunctional schools and families. I did the same at discomfort indicator studies uh, 30 years later in 1990. Why? Because by, from, 19, uh, from 1960 to 1990, the number of black elected officials went up from 103 to over 9,000. So I looked at the discomfort indicators, see what kind of impact that made on black folk. Guess what? Black folk didn't get more elevated, got more enhanced. They went down. They went backwards. They were worse off with 9,000 blacks in elected office. First of them had three, 103. So there's no connection between putting a black person in office or putting a white person in office or putting the Democratic Party or Republican Party in office if they're not going to do anything specifically and solely to change the, the, the conditions and the purpose of slavery. They have, nobody's ever addressed that. All blacks want to talk about are things that, uh, that affect everybody. We're going we're gonna to put more money into the school system. We're going to build more highways. We're going to put out a health care program. They had all those things, but blacks were slaves and Jim Crow semi-slaves. Quit majoring in the minors and start going attacking the issues. Right, right. I'm going to, uh, tomorrow, I, I saw an interview you did with Boyce Watkins, and Boyce is a friend of mine, and you talked about uh, somebody should put together a list of things that Obama did or poli the policies that Obama put in place, how they impacted black people, things like that. There is a list. I'm going to email it to you. Um, I I'll email it to you. Uh, but that's another conversation. Um, but in, in on page, and I want to get to uh, level three that you're talking about, but on page 52 and 53 of your book, uh, A Black History Reader, 101 Questions You Never Thought to Ask, which is available at Powernomics.com, Powernomics.com. Uh, you deal with how our demographics changing in ma majority black urban cities. And you talk about how in the 21st century, the majority white population is in the midst of recapturing urban cities through a combination of, a combination of gentrification, privatization, and immigration. Initiatives used in urban cities to displace uh, blacks, to push them out, and to push those who remain into minority status with no power. Major political and economic efforts across the nation are systematically redeveloping those cities into comfortable havens for affluent whites and ethnic immigrants who are taking over the assets of urban cities. And also, and I want you to respond this in just a second, you also talk about how when black mayors took over in like the 19, late 60s, 1970s, like Mayor Coleman Young and things like this, the, the, the cities had a decline in tax base. The cities were uh, already in trouble when, when, when they were turned over to black people. Talk about that. Well, to well, use the choice as an example, you're right, Michael. See what happens when, when, when black folks say they want to social integrate. White folks then stop having ethnic communities. All of a sudden, the Jewish community, the Polish community, the Irish community, Italian community, they said, hey, if these black folks are going to come together and try to integrate with us, 
Then us who forget, drop our ethnicity, come together as white folk, and get away from them. And then, so they moved across Eight Mile Road and started building suburbs. Mm -hmm. When they moved out of the city, they extracted the entire wealth base and took it with them across Eight Mile Road. Yes. They took all the factories, the industry, the cottage businesses. They took the tax base. They took everything outside the city. They stripped the city. And so black folks, the black mayor that hadn't had a snowball's chance of being effective unless they started practicing group economics and group politics. And that's what I try to do for the black blacks of Detroit. I also try to help blacks in, in New Orleans, the same thing in California. Right. Right. Go back and start practicing group economics and quit taking your money. But see how people, in many respects, were so silly. They would follow whites to the suburbs and say, "If y'all move to the suburbs, we have to, we'll take our money. We'll get in our car, drive out to your money, and they would give it to you." And see, right. that means that white people, in, in, uh, when they move, white people have been living and all for, and not only whites, Asian, Arab, and Hispanic, all mm -hmm. of them, they live off of two incomes. They live off of one hundred percent of their money because all those groups. Whites, Asians, Arabs, and Hispanics, they practice group economics. They spend 100% of that money giving their own people. But then on top of that, they go to the black community and put up businesses and, and suck 98% of the blacks' money out of their communities and bring it back to their communities. So therefore, Arabs, Asians, and whites, they live off of two incomes, 198%. They leave black folk only 2% in their community to live off. It's impossible. It was impossible in Detroit for Detroit to survive trying to live off of 2% of their income and giving 98 percent to whites living across eight mile road that is and so now whites have gotten smart and said well what now these blacks are so poor and impoverished mm -hmm. they're so weak they can't do anything let's go back in and take those cities back over that we sucked all the money and wealth out and see wealth is attached to color skin color so they right. put all that wealth and they sold back in and build and rebuild the toy and so then when they come back in once they gentrify the city again as it was before they left it they're going to privatize everything that is owned by the public in detroit Yes. What they're gonna do? They, they're gonna they're gonna put it in the hands of whites. They're gonna go after the Bastard Bridge. They're gonna go to the Collins, the Canada. They're gonna they're Bell gonna Isle. privatize the Riverfront, Cobo Hall, Jolis Arena. They're right. The sewage system, the water system. The water system, Bell Isle. Yes, all of that. Bell Isle, everything. Yep. And these black folks say, "Well, Doctor, we're we're better off now because yes, white folks took all the money to the suburbs and with them, and we left us nothing. But they're coming back, and they're gonna bring it back. They're gonna own everything. We'll be back to where we were a hundred years ago. But I, it's like just like a black woman away from the plantation. He find out to get out of the woods and get hungry. He run, he'll run back to the plantation. So <laughs> they didn't have a plan. <laughs> they didn't have a plan. Okay. Went back to the, I'm going to back to the mountain. I, I, I get some fat back and some cornbread and I get back on the plantation. I'm in the woods. I don't have anything. They never stop and say, well, you know what? If I quit giving whites my money, if I quit giving white folks 98% of my money, mm -hmm. if I quit putting my money to, to, to Arab, Arab businesses, Asian businesses, in Detroit, Michigan, you got a 90% black city, and the, and the Arabs own, out of 146 gas stations, Arabs own 144. Mm -hmm. They own all your food stores, grass stores, liquor stores, party stores, discount stores. Indians own all your 7-Elevens, Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, Korea right. own all your cleaners and the hair care and nail shops. Black folk are not practicing a damn thing in their self. Try to get their money to white hands as fast as they can once they get paid. I understand. Hey, Doc, we I, I want to go to level number three. Uh, so no, level number one is get land. Level number two is politics. What's level number three? And, and again, this is called this is called the Anderson five story building in Anderson yeah. mm -hmm. number, number, number three is, is the court system. And, and, and the police department, the law enforcement, black folk have never understood that, that, that what controls the law and the, and, and, the, and the court system is the politicians, and the politicians are controlled by the economics. And so, and so that, that's why I see a mafia understand that what the mafia does, they take their money, the first thing they do, they buy every attorney. They buy the best attorneys. They buy the, the police commissioners. Mm -hmm. They buy the police officers. And this goes all the way back to slavery, too. So when they shoot black folks down, they're not shoot, they, they shoot the weakest thing, the poorest thing will get shot first. And, and, and that goes back to, to the Second Amendment and the Constitution. See, the Second Amendment and the Constitution went into effect starting in 1643, when they said, we're going to start enslaving black folk, but enslaving blacks so they won't get upset with us doing it. We must, we must pass a law called a gun control law so that no black can be caught with a gun, a weapon, a tool, a knife, or a hatchet, or anything else to defend itself. That became a permit, and that put into the Constitution as a Second Amendment, which says, and, and, and it says and that was the first thing, strip them of any weapons so they can't revolt and can't get angry about it. The second thing that in, in the Constitution, in the Second Amendment, it says that every white male between 18 and 45 must register, must register 
with, with the state militia. Now they you call them the, the National Guard. And they must register and what they'd be on call and carry a weapon at all times. So that in case of a slave revolt on insurrection, they can come out and put it down. Right. By right now, there's about 367 million, uh, million weapons in the United States. Whites own and control 99% of them. And every time they want to make sure blacks stay harmless, so that's why after slavery, again in the South, they passed laws saying black folk could never call, they, they couldn't carry a pistol, they might carry a shotgun, that was it. And right now, whites control all those weapons, and they go into these major urban areas and tell the black folk, we're going to have a turn in your gun law, because you black folk are silly enough to shoot your own people. But if you come and turn in your gun, we'll give you a bag of groceries on a Saturday. And then when you don't have any weapons, we take your butt back to slavery again, and a Jim Crow segregation. So the weapons, that, that law is pertaining to keep blacks in a harmless state. And that's why right now you've never, you've never ever seen or heard about on a rare occasion in all these years of a, of a black policeman shooting white folk, or shooting white men. You know, you don't see the, you don't see the white men shoot women or gays uh, or, 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 or they shoot black folk because you're the weakest link economically in the country. Right. Okay, so uh, uh, three things here. Um, one. Um, you talked about the Second Amendment. So that's that's part of the Bill of Rights, 1791. That's when it's put into place, 1791, the Second Amendment. Uh, the, 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 the first ten amendments, which and those who haven't read the Constitution, amendment means to alter or change. That's, that's put in place in 1791. Um, secondly, um, the, with, dealing with the Second Amendment, um, the, the Federalist Paper number 29, ties into the Second Amendment and helps to further define it. And the Federalist Papers were uh, papers that were uh, written uh, dealing with the Constitution. And so people need to read Federalist Paper number 29. If I remember correctly, that was written by Alexander Hamilton. That gives more background information. That gives more background information on the U.S. Constitution, on the Second Amendment, okay? Uh, third, uh, go ahead. Let me make it one point, and also if you go back to the Federalist Paper, you'll see what it said. The Federalist Paper was the foundation for the Constitution. It also said, yes. if you have democracy, again, that's what I want people, black folks, to understand, especially in Detroit, Michigan, that now they're going back into colonization. They're going to be back 200 years coming up as whites take over and gentrify and, and privatize Detroit. In the Federalist, Federalist Paper, it said that in a democracy, if you're going to enact a democracy in the United States, we're where the majority will win and the minority will lose and suffer and be controlled then you must, you must understand that if you do not take care and protect the interests of the minorities, then the minorities have absolute no incentive nor reason to abide by any laws that you put in place. That is the base on that's the federal state you're talking about. Right. It's, 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 yet they've never abided by it. They never, right now this country is still ignoring the needs of black folks. They haven't uh, corrected the maldistribution. They're bringing in immigrants, an unending influx of immigrants over black folks. They're burying black folks. And that's why, that's why the number of immigrants in this, uh, Hispanics, as an example, I shouldn't even call them Hispanics, they were millions, were written Latinos. And, and during the slave, you only had about three to 4,000 in the entire United States. Mm -hmm. When you had 5 million black folk in, in, that were enslaved, almost 5 million. And now these Hispanics are coming in this country in such a large number that, 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 that by 1900, you had 100,000 Hispanics in the United States, but you had 12 million black folk. They had the same identical birth rate. And in, and in 100 years, Hispanics caught black folk and passed them. That at 100,000 passed black folk, and now you got 57 million Hispanics in the United States and only 44 million blacks. Black folk are now beneath Hispanics. Hispanics are now pushed blacks out of being second-class citizens. Blacks in America are third-class citizens. In about another six years, the Arabs and Asians, Hispanics are going to get together. They're going to make black folk then third-class citizens. And black folks should say, we got nothing. We were, when we were second-class citizens, use your creative imagination that you didn't get anything to be third-class. You didn't get a damn thing. You become fourth-class. Right. Okay. So... Uh, let's go to number four. Number three was court system. What's number four and what's number five? On your five-story building. Okay, okay. Now, okay, the third floor was, say, was the court system. And police. Once you get the money, you control the politics. The politics will control the police department. Mm -hmm. And don't, don't shoot no more black folk. Because, because black folk got enough wealth and money now, they'll take you out and shut off the money in this country. But so you go to the fourth floor. Fourth floor is getting communication systems. Mm -hmm. And that's what black folks do. You got, the media. 12, you got about 12,000 cable systems in the United States. Blacks own zero. You got about 12,000 radio stations. Blacks own something like about 50 or 60. You got 5,000 uh, TV stations. Blacks don't own about one at best. You got about 5,000 daily newspapers. Blacks own zero. 
You don't own any communications. All you got now is what they call social media, and most of that's unreliable. You can't you can't prove anything. Black folks should be demanding. But by the same token, when Obama was in the office mm -hmm. his last year, he called in Indians who never put him in office. They and they were they were and all these Indian tribes were slave holding tribes. They're descendants of, sl of slave holding Indians. He called them every year to the White House and gave them three and a half billion dollars every year for, for six straight years. In the seventh year, he turned around and gave the Indians as, as many radio station licenses, cable licenses, and TV licenses. They wanted free. And when that, 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 that broke the law, that broke the 1866 Indian Treaty. Obama broke the law. What he did was unconstitutional. It was illegal and immoral for him to bring in slaveholding Indians and give them everything and then invite one black freeman and one black Indian that was included in that 1866 Indian Treaty, which is based on the 13th Amendment, which says that black folk must be treated in all manner similar to the way any Indian ever is treated and must get the same benefits and returns that they get in, every, in all respects. Right, and I, I talked about that on my radio show when I was on the Parliament Radio Network. Your wife, your wife sent out the press release uh, dealing with your fight, dealing with the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866. So I talked about that on my show. Now we're coming up on the break. Hey, Doc, you got a few more minutes? Yeah, yeah. Let okay. Me, let me give you about another five or six minutes. Okay, because we're coming up on a break. We'll be back in uh, five minutes here. We're coming up on a break, and then we'll continue for another five minutes. I just want to uh, 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 wrap up, some, tie some things up. But um, also, when you talk about uh, President Obama and the meeting at the White House with the Native Americans, and I, I talked about that on my show, actually. There are, five, there are about 500, uh, I think it's 566 federally recognized tribal nations in this country, okay? Now, are you talking about a meeting of all 566, or are you talking about a meeting specifically of the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians, which were those, those five civilized tribes of Native Americans? Go ahead. They had 564 of those so-called representative Indian chiefs. And right now, my harvest think tank, my lawsuits against the federal government, I, right now, there's a black woman I got running out out against the Cherokee County. She's running to be an Indian chief. So we're supporting her out there. And mm -hmm. the what's, what's her name? Uh, she's uh, Brown. Her parents' name is Leatrice Brown. They are the point of the spear in our 1866 Indian Treaty right now against all five civilized tribes. And the black people know all those civilized tribes, as you know, were slave-holding tribes. Mm -hmm. They fought in the South. Right. As a matter of fact, a black escaping from a, from a plantation, any of the $25 to go capture and bring it back. And if they, if they did bring it back uh, uh, alive, they could bring it back dead and get $20 to bring it back his scalp and his hair attached. And right. what those Indian tribes would do, they would torture those blacks. They would castrate them and keep them in the woods and bring them back dead. That's why black folk, a lot of blacks were scared to run away from the plantations because they were fearful that the Indians called them, the Indians would castrate them and torture them and then kill them and just bring back their scalps. Right. Okay, we're coming up on a break here. And you, you're speaking specifically of the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians. Is that correct? The five civilized tribes and Native Americans. Those five tribes were the top tribes. That right, all exactly, tribes. exactly. All Okay, stand by. We're coming up on a break. We'll be back in a few minutes. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We're speaking with Dr. Claude Anderson, the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation, the Future Radio. We'll be back in a few minutes. <laughs> Hello, everybody. All right, stand by, guys. All right. All right, stand by, guys. We'll be back in four. We'll be back in four minutes. Yep. Okay, I'm going to try to squeeze in this clip here from the state of uh, black America. We have it queued up. Yep, well, oh. the Roland. Yeah, yeah, Roland Martin, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, you got queued up uh, one hour, 58 minutes, 30 seconds. Yes. Okay, that's about that's about two, that clip is about two minutes, I think. Um, and um, that deals with pension funds. So I'm going to try to squeeze that clip in and have him uh, wrap up with uh, five and six. I mean, number five, okay. Did you uh, want to write the next caller's number? Uh, Andre, Andre's going to call in. Okay. Andre Batts is going to call in. How's everybody doing? Stand by. We're on a commercial break. We'll be back in four minutes. Hey, if you want to advertise with the African History Network, uh, okay, uh, What? we only have one guest line? Or we have two? It's six. It's six guest lines? Yeah. Okay, I gave him, um, uh, what, he's on line one, Dr. Anderson? Yes. Okay. Um, guest line... Uh, Number two, write down the number for guest line number two. I'm gonna tell Andre to call in guest line number two. Uh, 
Okay, guys, jam packed show. Hey, if you if you're a black business owner, hold on. All right, guys, if you are a uh, African American business owner, you want to advertise with the African History Network show. Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. Customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com to advertise with the uh, African History Network show. We reach thousands of people across the country uh, each week on the audio podcast of our shows, and we're on six different podcast platforms. Six different podcast platforms. Uh, we reach thousands of people. Okay, um, email us customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com. All right. Okay, stand by. We'll be back. How, mu how much time we have before we get back? Uh, we have uh, a minute thirty. Okay. Okay, Andre should be calling you now. Okay. Nineteen a.m. Super. All right. How's everybody doing? Okay, stand by. Those on YouTube, I got to put this on mute. Stand by. We'll be back. Yep. Those on YouTube, we'll be back in just okay, a minute here. Please we'll okay. You on air shortly. Sound not clear. Yeah, you got to go back. You can watch this on. Uh, I don't know what's going on with the computer here. You can. Uh, One minute. Okay, watch us on Facebook Live, the African History Network, the African History Network on Facebook, or tune in at uh, nine ten a.m. Superstation dot com. Nine ten a.m. Superstation dot com. All right. Stand by those on uh, YouTube. Thirty seconds. Okay. All right. How's everybody doing? Those on Facebook, hey, share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in. Also, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, for uh, lectures for Michael M. Hotel for my lectures. So we have Andre on the line? Yes, he's on hold. Okay. When when Doc said Obama didn't do anything for black people, I I, I totally disagree with that. I'm gonna send him some documentation on that. You've heard me talk about that before. All right, let's go. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation, the Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, October 28, 2018, and we are live tonight. We are uh, wrapping up with Dr. Claude Anderson, author of Black Label, White Wealth, author of Polynomics, and his latest, latest book is a black history reader, 101 Questions You Never Thought to ask. You can get all these at powernomics.com, powernomics.com. And we're discussing uh, how black people can leverage our economics to enforce our politics. This goes way beyond just voting. And this deals with something I talk about called political self-defense, political self-defense. All right, uh, Dr. Claude Anderson, so you you laid out uh, uh, dealing with your five-story building. Uh, you, dealt, you dealt with get land is number one. Number two is politics and have your dollar uh, circulate eight to 12 times. Number three is get control of the court system and uh, uh, police departments. Number four is get, uh, get control of media and communication systems, uh, radio stations, TV stations, etc. cetera. Uh, what is uh, number five? And then I want to tie this into gentrification as well. Go ahead. Black folks have been victimized by fake information for so, for so many centuries. They always been taught to see everything upside down and backwards, or in this case, to see, so they never figure out how to come to a solution that, that is applicable to our people to solve our major core problems. See, to make your black folks well, you get what we need is education first. Education cannot solve black folks' problems. Right. Because it's just like I've said before, that there's no direct link between what the black person and the political office gets there. Mm -hmm. The same thing is true with black folk in education. Black people in America, the boy, I would say you need more education. Education it has no power to do anything. Education is a tool, just like a hammer and a salt. Right. Black folk right now have the, have the record of having of having the holding the highest academic achievement record on earth. Because black folk back to come out of slave would never deny the right to to, 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 to to be educated. White folks pass laws that if we catch you teaching a black person to write or read, it'll cost you one hundred dollar fine and thirty nine lashes. And if a black folk person got caught doing it, they would lynch and castrate it. So consequently by eighteen sixty six, Michael, mm -hmm. that the average that black people coming out of slavery in eighteen sixty six Ninety-six percent of all the black people coming out of slavery could not read and write because of, of 360 years of denial of, of right to read and imposed ignorance, ignorance that was imposed on them. So 96 percent could not read and write. But, it, but once they got free, I mean, in 1866, by 19, by 1896, guess what had happened? 
black folk have reduced their illiteracy rate from 96% down to 42%. What year was that? They did that by themselves in a 30-year time period. Okay. 19, 19, 1896. 1896. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. 18, 18, from 18... 66. Uh, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, Nobody on earth, neither Asians, nor Arabs, nor whites, nor else, have ever come out of slavery and in 30 years, reduced their illiteracy rate down and cut it in half by 50%. Right. But the problem was at the same time he brought this country, brought in about 20 million Europeans into the country mm-hmm. who had the same identical illiteracy rate of black folk. The Europeans coming into America, their IQ levels are something like their reading and writing levels are about 96%. The difference is they came in to go into a management class. They came in over blacks to manage blacks, and consequently, they, they, they moved up in the society and got jobs and elevated the quality of life, but black folk didn't. So what happened, so by 1950, what happened is that there was no connection between black folk getting an education and black folk deriving the benefits that should come from getting education. So by 1950, a black person with a, with a college education could not own half as much, half as, much as a high school dropout. Because mm-hmm. there's no connection between getting a black co- folk a uh, degree and getting and getting an elevated quality of life, because black folk don't have a community, don't have an economy. So once they get a degree, they got to go out and beg somebody else to get a job. That's what these civil rights organizations teach us. All we want you to do is go out and get a job. No other group looks for going out and getting get an education, get a job. They go out and get business opportunities and get wealth and power. Right. And that's why black folk right now, uh, uh, I can go out to any community. Across America, find black folk with master's degrees and doctor's degrees working at McDonald's and Burger King waiting on tables. So they have no businesses and no industries. They have no place to apply that tool I call education. So there's no, but if you get the money at the level, at the first floor, you got the wealth, you tell the, the fifth floor what to do. You say, based on what our needs are on the fifth floor, we got the money. You take it, here's what we want. We want discipline and astronauts, the chemists, the physicists. But see, as long as you don't have the money and wealth, all they're going to do is produce people can be janitors and, and, and wait on tables. Even they got a degree, they have no place to apply the degrees. Right, right. And, and, and the other thing is, and there's some other things that you deal with in your book and other books deal with this. You know, 1952 and 56, you had the U.S. Interstate Highway Act that drove uh, 41,000 miles of U.S. Interstate Highway all throughout the U.S. And they ran through about 1,600 black communities, wiping out thousands of our businesses, wiping out a lot of our homes. So this destabilized our economic base as well. OK, so when you have the civil rights movement, OK, and I'm not knocking anybody in the civil rights movement, when you have the civil rights movement, uh, our economic base was weakened because they were being wiped out by expressways, just like I-375 ran through Black Bottom and Hastings Street, Paradise Valley here in Detroit. And, and at the same time, they are employing white men to build these expressway systems. OK, so <laughs> so um, and then uh, tie this into how do we fight against uh, gentrification? I know we only have a couple minutes left. How do we fight against gentrification? And then talk about your bundle pack at PowerNomics.com. Go ahead. Well, you fight against gentrification by building your own communities and driving a sink in the ground. This is our territory. Mm-hmm. You build your own business and practice your own group economics. Thank OK. You. And then and that's the first thing. And secondly, you always demand. Never, never go by. See, if you start, you start talking about you're going to have a dinner. Hey, Doc. You, you dropped out for a minute, and if you, you said if you if you start talking about it, you're going to have a demonstration or something, go ahead. No, don't, don't, see, just the protesting is a waste of time. If you demand up front, you get what you want. That's what my Cuban friends told me. The Bay of Pigs, uh, uh, one of my friends was the biggest hero. He said, Doc, there's the biggest difference in this country for you all versus us as Cubans is that you all don't understand the nature of politics. Mm-hmm. That you, all, what you, all, all, you all want to protest and march. We demand and get. That's the difference. Everybody right. demands for black folk. Make a demand. We want to march. Right. But demanding ain't worth a quarter just like vote. Get your money, and your power, and your wealth, and your economic base started. Control all five stories and tell people you play to win. And you play by saying, I got, I got anybody that votes for us and uh, uh, will do something for us, we won't put you in office. If you're not, we'll build our own communities to go our own way and supply and put jobs, businesses, 
and employment and a tax base in our own community for our own people. You gotta be dependent and, and, and you become dependent by separating yourself from being a servant and carrying water for all these other groups. Quit spending all your time and energy trying to support other people. It's not your obligation. If the world right now is going down the toilet, let the people who got the most to lose fight the wars and worry about what's gonna happen to the uh, what happened to the world. Black folk must spend all their time and energy with that one and a half one percent of the wealth trying to save themselves. Why would black folk with one and a half to the wealth be worried about what happened to all the immigrants coming to the country or about gays, bitches, and humpbacks? Save yourself. And as a pilot, I'll tell you what, the first thing you learn as a pilot, right. if, we have, if we're taking off in, 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 in the nighttime, we get over 10,000 feet, I'm going to put oxygen to you. And in the daytime, we get over 30,000, I'm going to put oxygen to you. But I mean for the ground up, I mean for the ground up at night and for 10,000 in the daytime, you're going to get oxygen. And with a mass, if we lose the cabin pressure and uh, an amaranth push down a, a mass, and that mass falls down in that plane, you get up, put the mass on yourself first. Don't get up talking about anybody in fact that need a mass and you imagine compact women, gays, the bullying, uh, uh, me too, and that women, transsexuals, y'all need a mass. Sit down and take care of yourself. That's the biggest problem. The biggest problem, two things, including them getting off now. Okay. The problem you got is that nobody's ever addressed the, 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 the core purpose. And, uh, and accomplishment of slavery, which was a maldistributed 100% of his land, minerals, whites, tools, wealth, power to the hands of the white society. Right. That's the first thing that's never been corrected. The second thing is it also not only stripped you of your wealth and power and your privilege and your resources, it stripped of your social cohesiveness, where you can never come, to play, come together as a black person anytime, anywhere, and function collectively together in your own self-interest. Those are your two major problems you got in this country. You mentioned something about civil rights. Civil rights ain't worth a quarter. Civil rights has been diluted and watered down. You mm -hmm. know why I'm against civil rights leaders. Civil rights leaders that came in effect in 1865 was for black folk. The, the, the Supreme Court neutralized that and made it for everybody. It's not for everybody. The right. civil rights we talk about now has no application. It's illegal and unconstitutional if it goes away from black people. Right. Civil civil rights goes back to 1865 and 1866. You had a Civil Rights Act of 1865, which was vetoed, uh, which was vetoed, and then you had a Civil Rights Act of 1866, right after slavery ends, that that passed, and that formed the foundation of the uh, 14th Amendment of 1868. So when you had, so people have to understand that civil rights was only for black people. Civil rights was not for anybody else. It wasn't for white women, it wasn't for midgets, it wasn't for Hispanics, nothing. It was only for black people. And even uh, uh, September 24th, 1965, Executive Order 11246, signed into law by President Johnson, what we call affirmative action. That was only for black people also. In 67, then they're going to open it up to other people. But that was only for black people. We, so we have it, civil rights was not for everybody. Go ahead. That's right, and you're right, Matt, as a matter of fact, the civil rights thing is so we've been correcting the 1857 Dred Scott decision that mm -hmm. says a black married man has no rights that a white person is bound to respect because everybody else had theirs in the first, in the one through 12 amendments, but it said, but it said the black folk were not included, so black folk had no rights. That was the Ed Dred Scott decision of 1857. Right. So, the, so the civil rights laws, uh, bills came in and... and and the 13th, the 14th, and 15th Amendment, that was strictly a solely for black people. And, and, and the Supreme Court did not say women had no rights, gays had no rights, uh, lesbians had no rights, uh, uh, Arabs had no rights. It was strictly blacks. But the Supreme Court, that is, a, that is a guardian of racism, keep in mind this conclusion, the guardian of racism in America to make sure that you never can be can include blacks in anything, is the United States Supreme Court. The first 57 people put on the United States Supreme Court were slaveholders. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the other subsequent uh, 67 have been white racists. And that's why present day terms, if go to the Supreme Court, they just had this big issue about two or three weeks ago about putting somebody else on the Supreme Court. They're yeah, Greg Kavanaugh. White. Mm -hmm. white. But what they're saying is that in this country, that justice can only be seen through the eyes of whites. That's why right now you got eight and one half whites on the Supreme Court. Because they, and, 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 and that's why you'll never get injustice. And black folks should be saying, why in the world do you keep putting the whites on the Supreme Court? Why does why is half the Supreme Court black? Or why, how are they not going to do that? And that's why right now, they, 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 even Obama had a chance to put blacks on that. He goes mm -hmm. put white women on there. See, nobody respects black folks. Hispanic women, yeah. You don't demand anything. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, okay. 
Go ahead and uh, talk about the bundle pack at powernomics.com. I know you have to get out of here. Your wife's going to beat me up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. And get all these things, Michael, by going to the Powernomics website. Go to powernomics.com and order what's called the library pack. They can get all five of my books, Black Label, White Wealth, Powernomics, Two Dirty Little Secrets books, and the last book called The Black History Reader. And now these books are all number five stars with, with Amazon and around the world. They're the best read books in the history of this nation for black folk. Mm -hmm. There's no books that are going to be better than these books on the market. They'll tell black folk everything they need to know. That's why it's called the library pack. You get that library pack, all five books plus a DVD for $99 or a special. Get those books and you throw the rest of the books into the wastegate if you want them. They'll cover everything <laughs> you need to know about black people. And, uh, and I'm just disappointed that in the city of Detroit, mm -hmm. where I, I keep getting reports that 50% of the black kids graduating from school, high school in Detroit cannot read and Right. And that and the reading level is at a fifth grade level. And I ask, what books are mine in the public schools? None, Dr. Evans, because you, you're a black man. Those books are about black folk. And they go to charter schools in Detroit. Uh, my books in the charter schools, no, those books, no, no, they don't want no books about black folk. <laughs> Most of the kids are black. The majority of the kids are black. And if, and then the why, why, the, why they sit there reading about Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, George Thomas Jefferson, and Patrick Henry all day long, and Benjamin Franklin, and right. read these books telling them what the problems are and how to get out of them. Well, well, maybe the white superintendent here in Detroit to straighten things out, man. I, I guess cause they, they want another white savior. First, they had Jesus from Livonia to come to save black people. Now they got the white superintendent of the public schools to save uh, black people too. So, you know, because Jesus from Livonia, that's Mike Duggan for those that don't know, the white mayor here in Detroit. He moved from Livonia to come to Detroit to save black people. Yeah, okay, whatever. You, uh, what is it about the last 500 years of history people don't understand? Go ahead. That's what I'm asking. What, what is it black folks understand? Right. Uh, that, that, that they, that they are a permanent underclass. And an underclass means those individuals who are locked into a social construct. That's why the first question in the Black Reader deals with that. You're locked into a social construct mm -hmm. that you would never get out of under the, in the present dilemma. And that even if black folks were able to, to catch, if, if white folks were to give black folks most of the stuff they need right now starting today, guess what? Mm -hmm. White folks got such a head start on you, it'll take another 239 years for blacks to catch up with whites where whites are today. Because yeah. black folks were that far behind. And yet they're sitting in Detroit, used to be our city, I used to love and respect, doing absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And trying to codify and legitimize whites taking over the city, privatizing, gentrifying, while there's no black folks in their homicide and and, 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 and atomized. Right, right, the brain damage. Yeah, and that was actual study. Uh, it would take the average black family 228 years to to um, achieve the same amount of wealth that the average white family has today. That's if everything stays uh, constant. Uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com has an article about that. Okay, get that. Because the average white person has right now has 3,500 times more wealth than the average black. And for a black woman, for every dollar that a white woman has in this Me Too movement, uh, uh, the white black woman has two cents. And what black folks should be doing is have them a movement called, instead of a me movement, black folks say, we're going to start the us movement. Going mm -hmm. back to looking out for us. That's why you hear me <laughs> talk about why, why I'm not in, into any of the isms. The only ism I'm into is blackism and ourism. Right, stay out of horizontal <laughs> issues. <laughs> stay out of horizontal issues, right. Okay, no, Doc. No horizontal issues. But, Michael, I got to jump off, buddy. Mm -hmm. I know. Hey, Doc, you there? Yeah, I'm still here. Uh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead and sign off. Go ahead. But, 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 I, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how many blacks in Detroit. And the last time I checked a few or three years, we very seldom ever get any. And I mean, nothing goes out of here goes to Detroit. It's out of, it's a, oh, you uh -huh. our state state, Really? Our book companies. Black for our uh, blacks have been zombified, animized, and hypnotized out of existence in that city. And that's my hometown. Okay, so so people, when you order, and see, we have people listening across the country. My show is national. We have people listening across the country. When you order from Powernomics.com, let them let let them know that you heard Dr. Claude Anderson on the African History Network show. Okay, with Michael and, M. Hotel. And, All right, let them know. I won't, because you're one of my favorite hosts, <laughs> and you're on the money and on the nails every time you swing that hammer. All right. You keep knocking them. And, and push out people and tell them I wrote these, I sacrificed my life, yes. all my years in politics and economics and politics and education and in the military to try to come up with strategies and critical examinations of where black folk are and tell them how to get out of it. And you, and you push it every time. That's why I
love you. You can ask me anytime to come on. I'll yes. be there. The tell black folks the time is running out. They're, they're in danger of being wiped off the face of the earth with this new movement and the conservatism that's spread across this country. Absolutely. All right, Doc, take care. Have a good night, okay? Take care, buddy. Bye-bye. Uh, all, right, all, bye. Right, all right, bye. All right, that was Dr. Right. Claude Anderson. Um, and... Um, author of uh, Black Label, White Wealth, author of Powernomics. You've seen him in Hidden Colors uh, 2 uh, as well. Uh, we're in the Black Friday documentaries together, two of the Black Friday documentaries, uh, also from director Rick Mathis. His latest book, A Black History Reader, 101 Questions You Never Thought to Ask. Uh, deals with a lot of history here, deals with economic empowerment, etc. It expands a lot on what he was talking about here in this uh, interview and deals with how to do that and how to implement it. Also, Poweronomics, uh, the national plan to empower black America, Poweronomics. His first book, Black Label, White Wealth, Black Label, White Wealth, um, the search for power and economic justice. These are all books in my library. And I mean, I read a number of different uh, authors. We have a lot of those scholars, a lot of the African Center scholars here on our show. Okay, um, stand by Andre Batts. We're coming up on a break. I want to play this clip here. Uh, we didn't have a chance to get to it. This deals with leveraging our economics to enforce politics. This is from the State of Black America. Roland Martin uh, just aired this this past Saturday, October 27th. He's talking to, to uh, Reverend Al Sharpton. Let's listen to this. When we talk about the money as consumers, one of the things, and it hooks right into what has to happen in the midterms, we are financing the breakdown of our own community. We started an initiative in Nash Action Network this year looking at pension funds. They take pension funds. Okay, hold on, stop right there. Who is a public worker if you are a teacher, a firefighter, a police officer, a city, county, state, federal worker, stand up. No, 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 I want you to stay standing. I want you to stay standing right. because I need, I, I need you to understand the point that Reverend Sharpton is about to make. Reverend, go ahead. They take your pension funds, give it to money managers to invest, the money managers invested with developers that gentrify you out of your own neighborhood and you paying for it. I went to a union. 82% of the union members are black. Not one money manager invests their funds. I'm not talking about what you spend. I'm talking about what come out your check and pensions every week. You never ask them, who is managing our funds? And we have people on Wall Street. Roland knows them, mm -hmm. and uh, Dyson knows them. You know Tracy Mead and others that can invest funds that don't have any union accounts, any municipal accounts, any state accounts. The city of Indianapolis should be using some blacks to invest that money. So grab right there. Okay, we're going to pause it right there. We'll pick this up on another side of break, and we'll go to Andre Batts dealing with the uh, Motor City Black Age of Commerce Convention. And uh, Reverend Al Sharpton is talking about not a single black money manager was handling their pension fund dollars. The African History Network Show, 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by, stand by. All right, we'll be back in two minutes. Mandatory break. How's everybody doing? How's everybody doing? Uh, on YouTube, the audio is coming from the laptop. It's screwed up. I don't know. Uh, you can listen at, uh, we just posted a link again. Listen at 910amsuperstation.com. Um, and um, 910amsuperstation.com. And watch us on Facebook Live, The African History Network the African History Network on Facebook as well, okay? How's everybody doing on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network? All right. Hey, uh, do me a favor. Just tell Andre we're coming to him in just a minute here. All right. Say sorry for the delay. All right, those on Facebook, how's everybody doing? Uh, sorry for the delay, but after the break, we're coming directly to you. Okay. All right. Please help. So we have... Um, One minute. Okay, cool. And I posted the link here. And see, Doc and I, you know, we had these private conversations. Um, 
So I'm posting a link here on the thread of the broadcast, Facebook Live broadcast, right? Read this document here because Doc, Doc hasn't read it. I'm going to send it to him. This is progress of uh, the African-American community in the Obama administration. And this documents how policies from President Obama were beneficial to the African American community. Thirty seconds. I do research from a number of different sources, okay, uh, and I monitor about thirty-five different news sources on a daily basis uh, during the Obama administration. So we'll post this here on Facebook Live and uh, also on. Uh, YouTube. Okay, so tr Trump has reversed over 100 policies that President Obama had in place. I mean, these policies were beneficial to African Americans, but we don't know they existed. Okay? All right, let's go. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, on the Superstation of Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, October 28, 2018. Uh, we just spoke with uh, Dr. Claude Anderson, and we were dealing with how to leverage our economics to enforce our politics. Next, we're joined by uh, Andre Batts. Andre Batts is um, with the, the founder of uh, the Motor City Black Age of Comics. It's a... Um, Black Comic Book Convention, and it is coming up uh, Saturday, November 3rd uh, in Detroit at my alma mater and Dr. Claude Anderson's alma mater, Wayne State University. Uh, Andre Batts is a Spirit of Detroit uh, Award winner and the creator of Urban Style Comics Dreadlocks, uh, the Dreadlocks series from Urban Style Comics. And he's also the founder and coordinator of Detroit's minority-based uh, comic book convention, the Motor City Black Age of Comics. Hey, Andre, how you doing tonight? All right, man. Sorry, we're running late tonight. You had Dr. Claude Anderson on. <laughs> we ran a little over, but thanks for holding. Thanks for holding. Okay. All right. So tell us what's, you know, the, uh, I was telling Dr. Claude Anderson, you know, the film Black Panther debuted February 6, 2018, broke a lot of records. Uh, uh, many black people, many African Americans across the country were uh, uh, really impressed with it, inspired by it. And I said that uh, this, this summer and this later this year, the black comic book conventions, they're going to be sold out because now this is causing a renewed interest in uh, black comic book uh, characters and black comic book lines, okay? So talk about what's going to take place uh, this coming Saturday at Wayne State. Well, this coming Saturday, you know, I'm putting on the uh, World City Black Age of Comics, which will consist of different artists and creators coming together to introduce their characters you know, to uh, our community. Yes. Uh, this year we have several different things going on. We have a, a, a gaming throughout the day. We also have a steampunk character building workshops. We have the African Origins of Superheroes with uh, Brother Keith Young. We have the You Create Comics workshop with Victor Dandridge. Mm. Uh, we also have um, Mastering Your Promotions with Michael Watson. Uh, we, the main thing is we have the panel discussion, uh, panel of uh, Black Panther decoding mm -hmm. with uh, your, yourself, Brother yeah. Keith Young, and uh, Sankofa. Yes. It's going to be moderated by Kelly McAlphine. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be using, we're going to also get into using mythology to create comic book stories, you know, with Brother Keith Young. And we're going to have live hip hop performances as well. Uh, throughout the day, it's going to be a pretty, pretty busy day. You know, yes. we have five different rooms and, and like three different things going on in, in the five different rooms. Okay, so this is taking place Saturday, uh, November 3rd, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. at Wayne State University uh, at the Student Center Building, which is in Gullen Mall, 5221 Gullen Mall in Detroit. So you can use that address. And, uh, I, you know, I'm on a panel dealing with Black Panther Decoded. You know, I've done a number of different lectures dealing with the film Black Panther, dealing with uh, not just the African cultural influence and African history uh, that's related to the film, but also some of the history of the Black Panther comic book. Because I explain to people, you have to understand the history of the Black Panther comic book to really understand the movie. Okay, you have you have storylines, you have themes, you have characters that come from the Black Panther comic book. And I had to go in your research, really, the 52 year history of a Black Panther comic book and uh, to be able to do my presentations. And I also read uh, over 100 articles dealing with the film Black Panther and dealing with the uh, comic book as well. So um, talk about 
Uh, now, this is the 10th year that you've been doing this, right? So uh, what caused you to start this uh, black comic book convention? Because they're white comic book conventions. Why, 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 why did you have to start this one? Well, it started mine due to you know, lack of well, uh, lack of participation. Not not really lack of participation. The fact that we had lack of images in, in certain comic book conventions. You know, like you said, white conventions everywhere. But we represent a very small, minute percentage inside of the uh, those comic book conventions. So I decided to establish Long Street Black Age to introduce our creativity where people can actually see us. Because if you go to a regular comic book convention, you're really not going to see us. We're going to be one in the corner here, one in the corner there, one <laughs> right. in the center. Right. And you can walk through the whole convention and 99% 90, 90 of the individuals plus our Caucasians. Whereas with this one, the 90% that you have is basically us. Okay, absolutely. So um, t tell us what, so we have the... Um, panel discussions that are taking place and the and the uh, workshops taking place as well. And uh, the work the panel discussion I'm on is at 3.30 p.m. I guess it's 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. Uh, Black Panther Decoded. Um, talk about some of the exhibitors that are going to be there. Who, wh what can people expect to see? And they'll be able to buy these comic books, these t-shirts, these products also, which helps to support black-owned businesses, which is what Dr. Claude Anderson was just talking about. Talk, talk about that aspect, the exhibitors. Well, number one, we're going to have uh, Brother Arbel Jones, mm -hmm. which um, a lot of people may be familiar with Arbel Jones. He's been doing comics, you know, since the uh, 70s. You know, he was drawing, like, you know, uh, Iron Fist. He's the co-creator of Misty Knight, uh, of uh, Luke Cage. Yeah, for Marvel Comics, Misty Knight, yeah. Marvel Comics, mm -hmm. for those who don't know. Um, that's the, the special guest. We have uh, myself, of course, with dreadlocks, black watch, the hot AD, and my products being, you know, a native of Detroit, so you know, I got to pump myself up, of course. Right. We have uh, Mike Watson, Mike Watson of uh, Freestyle Comics. He's coming up from uh, Columbus, Ohio. He has a character called Hot Shot, and he's also publisher or editor, rather, with uh, Short Views Media, and uh, he's doing quite a few things. We have... Uh, uh, Brother T.I. Walker, who's out of Detroit as well, he's doing some things with his characters. You know, he's just introduced a new character called uh, Awesome, uh, All Star, rather. Sorry, I called him Awesome. Okay. It's an awesome comic book, so I should say that. Uh, he's doing his thing. Then we have, uh, then we have, uh, who else we have? We have Abdul Lahat of Crescent Comics. He's got a character called Jihad. Mm -hmm. As well as he's working on a an amphibian style uh, character group of Atlantis, Atlantis right. style comic book, uh, which is pretty deep. Uh, he's going to be introducing that at the show. We have uh, Jarvis si uh, Sheffield of Black Science Fiction because he's going to come on board and introduce you know, his science fiction books and other things that he has. We have uh, Brother Jeff Carroll. He's coming up from Florida. He has his own. They call him get him on the uh, Science fiction books, plus he's going to be doing a panel uh, called the Monster Panel, which is about the, the need of black science fiction because just like we don't have any you know, black comic book creators out there representing the whole, the masses, right. uh, we also are lacking in science fiction as well. Uh, we have uh, Tyrone Dickey who's going to be coming on board. You know, he's got you know, a staff of time. Uh, comic that he's going to be introduced to the public. Oh, I know Tyrone. Yeah, Tyrone and stuff. Yeah, Tyrone uh, makes hats. He likes to uh, make custom hats and things like that. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Yeah, I know Keith. Some of his material as well. We have Detroit Tradecraft. Detroit Tradecraft is like an organization of different comic book creators, artists, writers. Uh, it's a consolidation of us who, you know, we bring new individuals, younger individuals on board and help guide them and, you know, their direction as far as their comics, whether it's writing, whether it's uh, doing panel work within the comics, uh, artwork. We have uh, it's everything related to comics and film. That's what Detroit Trade Graphs is all about. Absolutely. Uh, we have, you know, we have um, 
Brother Mark Dudley coming down from Pontiac. Mm-hmm. You know, he's, uh, he's going to be doing a, a workshop about comics and manga because now a lot of the younger kids or whatever they're doing, uh, they're into more or less manga more so than traditional style comics. But he's doing a workshop on developing and creating the manga and telling the story. Right, hey, hey Andre. I only, I only have a couple minutes left here in the in the interview. Uh, so sorry to cut it. Sorry to cut a little short. We're running behind schedule tonight. Uh, let people know how they can get tickets and how much does it cost and uh, what what's the age range for children? Okay, to, to attend also. Go ahead. Okay, they can go to the Eventbrite Motor, Motor City Black Edge Comics Eventbrite page to get tickets. Okay. Or they can go to uh, Motor City Black Edge. 2016 at gmail.com for any questions or concerns. Give them that email address uh, again. Give them that email address again. Motor City Black Age 2016 at gmail.com. Okay. Oh, you can also, uh, as far as kids are concerned, mm-hmm. you know, all ages are come because it's kid friendly. The event is a $5 event for adults. Kids are free. Mm-hmm. Um, once again, it goes from 11 to 7 p.m. Right, and that's Saturday, November 3rd, 2018, uh, Wayne State University at Gullen Mall, 5221 uh, Gullen Mall. Go ahead, Andre. Correct, and like I said, if they have any questions, like I said, they can reach us at MotorCityBlackAge2016 at gmail.com and MotorCityBlackAge, the Eventbrite page, and you can buy your tickets right there, or you can pay at the door. All right, and, and we have the flyer at our website, uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. I put the flyer up there uh, today as well with the um, itinerary also, and we'll put a link on our website directing people also to the Eventbrite page uh, as well. Okay, and I'll, and I'll have a vendor table there as well. I have my DVD lectures, my lectures dinner with the film Black Panther. I'm on the panel discussion at 3.30 p.m. Uh, there also. Okay, Andre, thanks for coming on tonight, man, and I will see you Saturday, okay? Thank you. No problem, brother. Take care. Peace. All right, family. Uh, very quickly here, coming up Wednesday, October 31st, 2018, the next uh, Black Legacy Coalition community meeting dealing with saving the progressive progressive programming at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History is taking place Wednesday, October 31st, 2018, 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. at Cass Commons, uh, 4605 Cass Avenue at Forest. Uh, it used to be called the Red. Red door uh, is there at the at the church or right behind the church. Uh, the entrance we will use is at the back of the church off the parking lot. Yeah, that's the red door. You'll see the red door entrance. Uh, Black Legacy Coalition Community Meeting. We had Dr. Kapense Chiki. Chike on last uh, Sunday talking about this. I'm on the committee as well to save the progressive programming at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Wednesday, October 31st, 2018, 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Cass Commons, 4605 Cass Avenue at Forest Street. Come on out. Um, it's open to the public. Uh, we need your help. Okay, on the line, we are joined by uh, Dr. Walter Williams. Dr. Walter Williams is the author of The Historical Origin of Christianity and also The Historical Origin of Islam, and he will be speaking at Nandy's Knowledge Cafe coming up Friday, November 2nd, and Saturday, November 3rd, uh, to discuss this uh, his books and this historical topic. Hey, welcome to the African, welcome back to the African History Network show, Dr. Walter Williams. Maad Hotep, brother, how you doing tonight? Hey, Hotep, my brother. I'm doing fine. How you doing? All right, I'm all right, brother. Uh, sorry, we're running a little behind schedule tonight, man. Had Dr. Claude Anderson on in the first hour, so uh, a lot to cover. Okay, brother, so go ahead and talk about, you know, Detroit. You're coming back to Detroit, and um, go ahead and talk about uh, what your topic is going to be uh, Friday and Saturday at Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, located at 71 Oakman Avenue in Highland Park, Michigan. All right, well, uh, I'm going to uh, give a lecture on how the non-human Created a creature called Jesus the Christ was created out of a non human. A uh, created creature called the Virgin Mary was created. Uh, when it was created, by whom it was created, and how it was created. Right. So that's going to be a dynamic topic, and I'm going to discuss and, and, and impart a whole lot of uh, information that, uh, that no one has ever heard before, and I'm going to be the one to discuss it to them. So I'm looking forward to. Uh, give it this lecture and workshop, and uh, I urge uh, the people who attend my lecture workshop uh, that Saturday and Sunday is going to be the third and the fourth. 
the advantage, uh, like you mentioned. But I urge every person that comes there to bring their notebook and pen with them or uh, paper and pencil so they can take down notes as to how I instruct them to take the notes that they can understand and really understand how this created not human created creature called Jesus Christ was made, how this not human created creature called the Virgin Mary was created. So we need to have that information in our African community because our African community is in a dilemma at this time as I speak because of these various religions that has confused our community with uh, non-truth. In other words, we're going to get to the bottom and learn the truth that will make us free. So that's uh, what I'm talking about. I'm going to talk about Okay. Uh, next Saturday. Okay, so it's Saturday and Sunday. Uh, is that what it is? Okay, so Saturday, November third, uh, Sunday, November fourth. Okay, so I thought it was Friday, Saturday. Okay, so Saturday and Sunday, and with the first day you're dealing with the historical origin of Christianity. Second day you're dealing with Islam. Is that how it works? No, I'm going to uh, uh, the second day. I'm going to uh, have a variety of uh, topics that I want to talk about who is this man called God? Okay. And, uh, and tell the people about God, who God is. I'm going to talk about their own personal spirituality, what they were born with at the time of their birth coming out of their mother's womb. Right. And what it was given to at that time, and that no human on earth was born with a religion. Right. If an individual will understand that no human was born with a religion, that they, then they can understand uh, about what I'm saying about these, uh, about these man-made religions. Right. Uh, all religions are man-made, created uh, by man, to control the thinking of man and the actions of man. But if an individual human understand that uh, at the end of, of the nine months of incubation in their mother's body and womb, they came out a, a, a real live human being attached to her umbilical cord, and the umbilical cord was cut by the doctor to separate that human being uh, from his mother. But uh, at the time of the separation uh, uh, by the doctor from the baby child, of his mother, that baby child had an uh, indwelling spirit flowing through his body. Right. And therefore, every human born in this earth, you got uh, 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 over seven billion humans walking in this earth of all races, creatures, because they were all born the same way. All was not born with a religion. They were born with an indwelling divine spiritual birthright. That's right. your spirituality that you was given to this time of your birth by your mother and father. Who are your creators? Yep. So therefore, God has nothing to do with this. Some invisible God that you're thinking about and swirling on you, if it's been taught to you, that it's supposed to have you existed, but you, no human on earth has ever seen God. Right. So let, let me just say this quickly. Um, um, you deal with uh, both of your books, but also you deal with this from a historical perspective, and you deal with this from a... Uh, 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 African spiritual perspective and understanding that African people historically did not have religions. We had spiritual systems as opposed to religions. And okay. and we we understood that the first concept of spirituality comes from Africa, comes from African people. And uh, you deal with, um, oftentimes what a lot of people don't deal with is, uh, and we only have a couple of minutes here left, but you deal with the ecumenical councils, especially like the first nine which are really important to understand, starting with uh, the first council of Nicaea, the most important one was the Council of Ephesus of 431 AD, if I remember correctly. And then you also deal with Serapis Christos, which a lot of people don't understand, and that means Christ the Savior, Serapis Christos. Uh, talk about that for a minute. Well, I want to take the audience to the nine ecumenical councils, as you mentioned, the Council of Nicaea 1, 325, the Council of Council number 1381, the Council of Ephesus, 431, the Council of Chapters on 451, the Council of Customs No. 2, 553, the Council of, uh, uh, of, the Council of Customs No. 3, 680, the Council of Hyrule 754, the Council of Nicaea 2, 787, and uh, the Council of, of Customs No. 4, the, the Fortune Struggle Creek Controversy. So I want to uh, break all that down to the listening audience. It's te very technical now, but <laughs> right. so you, you can really understand it. And I'm the one, the first one that brought out uh, uh, the, the, the name Serapis mm -hmm. is attached to and, 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 and unified with this Jesus Christ. So Serapis became Christ at the Council of Ephesus. Mm -hmm. 431 AD, yeah. exactly, exactly. And, and, Go ahead. And, 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 and by way of Melchite Copsic Egyptians, our ancestors, mm -hmm. who created this image uh, called Serapis from the Ptolemy, 
of the successor of Dr. Daniel the Greek after he died in 323. Right. Uh, so therefore, this name, Serapis, became as a uh, composite name coming from Osiris and Apis, the right. rule of Memphis. So therefore, you had a Serapis, and the Serapis at the Council of, uh, of, of, of Ephesus in 431 became the Christ because the argument between the, the Monophysites and, and the Melchites that this Serapis did not have a human nature. Right. In order to have a human nature, one has to be born through the body of a female. Mm-hmm. And, and you have to have the female in this. So that's when, at the Council of Ephesus, they created this created creature that's not a human called the Virgin Mary. Mm-hmm. And giving this uh, created creature, the Virgin Mary, the attributes of Isis, and giving this uh, Virgin Mary, this created creature, the Virgin Mary, uh, the car of Isis. So right. one has to really understand that. I'll break all that down and uh, show you how it all in, unfolds by way of using historic. Uh, Data. Exactly. When you say the Kai, you're talking about the spirit of Isis. Okay. Exactly. So this ties right into ancient Egyptian uh, mythology, ancient Egyptian history. You have to understand history to deal with this. And unfortunately, when you st- when you read the biblical text, uh, the 66 books uh, of the Bible, the-, the biblical text does not deal with the ecumenical councils that shaped what is in the Bible and what was taken out of the Bible. So a lot of our, our-, our brothers and sisters, right, who practice religion, don't understand the history of the religion, they 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 may they may know what's in the what's in the religious text, but they don't know what's in the world history books. As I as I explain to people, world history is in world history books. Religious literature is in religious literature. World history is what happened. Religious literature is the result of what happened. Um, and go ahead with your final comments, brother. Well, you got the, the, the Bible. I'm going to explain that too. I'm going to uh, uh, explain uh, the Bible and its origin. Mm-hmm. You see, so I'm going to take you through and walk you through the origins of the Bible. And I'm going to, uh, you know, take you on that journey. But, uh, again, the Bible is a book that one has to believe in. If you don't believe in those narrative stories in the Bible, uh, you, the human being, by believing in those narrative stories, uh, you make it real in your life. Right. It's the characters that's talked about in the Bible real because you believe it. You right. See? So when an individual goes to church and sits in the pews of the church, that individual don't have to think. Right. <laughs> to believe. So therefore you're sitting up there giving all your spiritual power away to a dead white man on the cross that, that, that you call your savior. Right, right. So and slavery and your savior and your God is the same, then we are in trouble as a people. So therefore, you have to understand that the, 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 the icon, the symbol, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and the image of white supremacy is institutionalized in every Christian church throughout America and throughout the world. And that that, that, that dead white man on the cross is a symbol of, of, of white supremacy hanging on the cross. And, and then we are in the church as a people, the African people, bowing down to that, giving all our spiritual power to that. So therefore, we come out of the church spiritually, uh, 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 un, in, not empowered, but unpowered. Right, exactly. We, power. we give all our power away. Exactly. So we have to really understand that I'll break all that down. Okay, no problem. So it's going down Saturday, November 3rd, and uh, Sunday, November 4th at Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, the new Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, located located at 71 uh, Oakman Boulevard, uh, Highland Park, Michigan. And uh, for more information, call 313-865-1288, 313-865-1288. Uh, cover charge is $10. And, uh, huh? Go ahead. Yeah. It was a misprint there. Okay. Twenty dollars mm-hmm. to admission. Twenty dollars admission. Yeah, on, on the Saturday, and if an individual wants to come the next day, they can pay ten dollars. Oh, okay. So twenty dollars, twenty dollars for the first day. Yeah. Okay, and then ten dollars for the second day. Right. Okay, and uh, what what time is it uh, Saturday and Sunday? What are the times? Well, the doors are uh, going to open at about one o'clock. And okay. The, and after that uh, comes the lecture. Okay, and about what time are you going to approximately wrap up? One o'clock to about what time? Well, it will, it's no set time Okay. Uh, when we're going to wrap up, but we're going to wrap up in a reasonable hour and a time. Okay. So it's, it's, as long as the people are there and being enthused about uh, receiving the information that I'm going to impart to them, uh, I don't mind staying there with them until they get, uh, you know, that I think that they have enough to 
not to overwhelm them, but to right. enough for them to understand uh, what's being taught to them and what's being said to them. And what uh, we have been in, as an African people in this country, what uh, uh, confusion that we've been in. And I'm going to give them the key okay. to unlock their incarcerated mind. Okay. When you believe anything, then you are incarcerating your mind. You're limiting your thinking. So therefore, when you incarcerate your mind, uh, when you go to jail, you're being incarcerated in a jail cell. There's limited space in there. So if you, when you uh, believe in a religion, you're incarcerating your mind with limited thoughts. Your thoughts. Absolutely. Are well, I'm gonna give you the key that will unlock the jail cell, so you can walk out of there free. In order for us to be free. Uh, we're going to have to divest ourselves from all religions. We will never, ever be free as, a, as an African people on earth until we free ourselves and divest ourselves from all religions. Absolutely. That's Okay, he'll have his books there as well uh, at the lecture. How, if people uh, want to email you, get in contact with you, if they want to order your books, etc., how do they do that? Uh, you can email me at ancientegyptian at msn.com. Ancientegyptian at msn.com. Uh, when you email me, put your phone number there if you want to converse with me uh, further, then I can call you back and we can talk one-on-one. -on -one. Now, my books mm -hmm. are going to be on sale there. Yes. And I will be able to sign those books uh, uh, to you, for you. And uh, if you uh, don't live in uh, the Detroit area, uh, you can go on Amazon and order my books through Amazon or go to any African bookstore in your community and they should have my books. The Historical Origin of Christianity is my book, uh, one of my books, and the other book is right. called The Historical Origin of Islam. And that's about me, Walter Williams. The Historical Origin of Christianity by Walter Williams, The Historical Origin of Islam and, uh, by Walter Williams. Uh, I have both books there. Absolutely. Uh, Next weekend. Okay, brother. Okay, brother. I, I'll be there Sunday. I'm speaking somewhere else Saturday. Uh, so it'll be good to see you again. You have a great night. Tell your wife I said hello also. Okay, my hotel. And hotel. I'm uh, glad that you finally had a baby. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have a 19-month-old, 20-month-old daughter now, 20 months. Okay, brother. Take care. <laughs> All right. Take care. My hotel. My hotel. All right, uh, I want to go last. We're going to have a few minutes left here. I want to go uh, last to this clip here. This is from, um, uh, I want to go to the one um, dealing with young black Republicans. Uh, Roland Martin was at, so a number of young black Republicans met with Donald Trump this past Friday, October 26th, at the Young Black Leadership Summit for 18 to 35 year olds, okay, uh, at the White House. And this was uh, partly organized by. Uh, Candace Owens, uh, you know, the sunken place Candace Owens, um, the, who is the communications director for Turning Point USA. Just two years ago, she was the CEO of a website that was against Donald Trump, that was anti-Donald Trump. Uh, Roland spe uh, spoke with some of the young black Republicans there wearing the Make America Great Again hats, and he found out they didn't know a lot about history. They didn't even know who uh, Arthur Fletcher was, who's, who's one of the most prominent African-American Republicans. Let's go to this clip. That was a... Uh, right now, happening in D.C. is a young black conservative summit put on by uh, Turning Point USA. You've uh, Charlie Kirk, of course, is with that group, and also uh, Candace Owens. You know, she's all of a sudden the it girl uh, among uh, conservatives. Uh, Brandon is raising his eyebrows, and of course, uh, all of a sudden, Kanye is praising her, and she's got 800,000 Twitter followers, and folks are doing these glowing profiles of her. Well, here's the deal. Their conference started yesterday, last night, Donald Trump Jr., uh, he, uh, of course, uh, spoke to them. Uh, I'm going to pull up one of his tweets earlier. So one of the things they were complaining about, they were complaining about uh, major media not covering it. Well, here's the deal. Uh, we actually uh, tried to get credentials to cover the summit. We got a letter from them saying we were approved. Then it was like, oh, I'm sorry, my bad, y'all are not approved. Because the real deal is Candace Owens chose to block us. Uh, she blocked, she's blocked me on Twitter because she can't actually stand a level of accountability. But see, here's the problem. They don't control the White House. And I've been invited to numerous things at the White House. And so uh, she was a little shocked when she saw me uh, at the White House. But first off, uh, they were in the East Room uh, where Donald Trump spoke to them. Before him, Secretary Ben Carson, ben Carson uh, spoke to them as well. Uh, and uh, they claimed it was about 400 people. I've been in the East Room where it's been packed. It wasn't 400 people. Uh, but again, uh, this is some of uh, what took place today. 
Most of those police officers are Most of them are police officers. 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 Most of Okay, so um, watch this clip. Watch, watch it in full. Uh, uh, so that's from uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered. That's Roland's daily digital show. Go to Roland Martin on YouTube. Roland Martin on YouTube. You can watch that clip. That is from uh, October 26th. Uh, watch the broadcast from October 26th. Okay, and um, let's go back to some more of it. I think we have it queued up again. Go ahead. Out of the White House after uh, Trump spoke. Here is Trump speaking to the young black conservatives. Okay, we'll, uh, that's, uh, put me back on. Okay, that was a bunch of nonsense, Trump uh, speaking to them. Uh, the name of that clip is uh, Donald Trump Hosts Young Black Republicans. Donald Trump Hosts Young Black Republicans. That's from October 26th. They have the 12-minute clip there at Roland's YouTube channel, Roland Martin on YouTube. And uh, also, you can watch the full uh, show from October 26th as well, Roland Martin Unfiltered. This is like the best show on TV, just like News One now. And one of the things Roland said was these people, these young black Republicans, they were uh, 18 to 35 years old, basically, I think, or 15 to 35. Most, a lot of them don't understand history, and they don't know prominent black Republicans in the history of them. Like, didn't a lot of them didn't know who Arthur Fletcher was. And he said a lot of these people, a lot of these black Republicans wearing these Make America Great Again hats who were there, okay, a lot of them are just spouting buzzwords and catchphrases, but don't understand law, don't really understand policy. You have to watch the whole thing. Maybe next week we'll, we'll play some more of that because next week, uh, because midterm elections are coming up and next week is the last show before midterm elections, we'll deal with the history of why and how African Americans switched from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. And it was not because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. By 1960, two-thirds of African Americans had already switched over to the Democratic Party. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. we got the Mel Trek series, animated series for children. Uh, we have my DVD lectures there. We'll see you at Wayne State University November 3rd. We'll see you October 31st at uh, Cass Commons for the Black Legacy Coalition meeting to save the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. And we'll also see you in Nanny's Knowledge Cafe. Remember, at the, uh, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct role behavior. Wakanda forever is not over till we win. We'll talk to you next week. Peace. <laughs> All right, guys, got to get out of here. Got to make way for Pastor Mo. Did you see Pastor Mo come in? Nope. Okay. Okay, guys. Hey, um, if you like this type of information, 
You can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We need your help. Also, you can order uh, our DVD lectures and my lectures from africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com, okay? And if you are an African-American business owner, you want to advertise on the podcast of our radio shows and, and reach thousands of people across the country on a weekly basis, email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork.com, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, I'm seeing the information. We can get your we can get your 30 second to 60 second ad put into the audio podcast of this show here that I'm going to upload uh, Monday. And we're on six different podcast platforms. Okay, we reach people uh, all around the uh, uh, all around the country. All right, talk to y'all later. Peace. <laughs>